thrilled to be here in High Point. I grew up in Virginia, and I took a lot of my favorite vacations here. My mother worked in Hendersonville for our Mother Earth News, who ecology runs in my family. The talk today is about how to get rid of use of fossil fuels in the US by 2030. This is not a fantasy. This is an inevitability. And it's something that all of us can participate in and have as a fun project together. My goal is by July 4th, 2030, to look back at the bad old days of coal and oil and natural gas, like we would look back at horses and buggies. They're still in use, or eight-track tapes, or vacuum tubes. They may be around. Some people may be using them. But it won't be part of the mainstream of the United States. That's what authentic independence would be. So let's look at High Point. High Point is a community of about 100,000 people. You have manufacturing here. So it would probably take about two 280 megawatt plants to make this, this city and all of its businesses work. A natural gas plant, two of them, each one would produce 400,000 tons a year of carbon dioxide. If it's a coal plant, however, it's going to produce 2 million tons of carbon dioxide. It's going to produce 70,000 tons of ash. 108,000 tons of sludge. And imagine this room completely filled and dripping over with sludge. And that's every year. And imagine then two of those every year. 95 pounds of mercury, which is very toxic, even in tiny quantities. Uh, it goes into fish. Women who are pregnant eat fish. And then they have a toxic womb filled with mercury. And 125 pounds of arsenic, which is deadly poison. We can replace that with systems that have zero toxins. What's the impact of this? Per capita health costs in the United States are a whopping $9,000 a year. Why are they so high? We keep talking about it as if it's because of the insurance companies. No, it's because we're living in poison. We create all this poison. And about a third of our health care costs, according to an article by EPA scholars, uh, $886.5 billion. So imagine about $3,000 a year is spent just detoxifying from all of that coal, natural gas, and oil. About 30 to 40 percent of all deaths worldwide are from pollution. Why do we want to keep making more of it? We think a safe level of carbon dioxide is about 350 parts per million. Now, it's over 400 parts per million. I have friends who are on Facebook who are posting that, because you can measure it just like you can measure it with a thermometer outside your house. The amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere hasn't been seen for over 3 million years since the Pliocene, when the Eohippus was going around barking and, and roaring, or whatever Eohippus is, or Eohippi did. <laughs> and if all these public companies, which have shareholders, ExxonMobil and others, burn all the carbon on their spreadsheets, we'll have over 600 parts per million and temperatures will be up 6 degrees centigrade, more than 10%. I mean, sorry, 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Does that matter? 10 degrees, does it matter? Well, you have highs and lows. Some places will be colder, some places are hotter. Every day that you have crops exposed to 90 degrees Fahrenheit uh, increases the possibility of crop failure by 10%. Do you want to have an extra 10 days a year of 90 degree weather? No. Also, those climate impacts. Imagine a tornado. Imagine if a tornado was here in this room right now for 30 seconds. Do you think we'd survive? Now imagine Haiyan over a city, Leyte, which is unfortunately the, the capital of geothermal energy for the Philippines. They get about 27% of their energy from geothermal. Imagine a tornado. It's a hurricane, but at 300 mile an hour winds for four and a half hours just rotating over and ripping everything up. It killed 10,000 people. It made over 600,000 people homeless. If current trends continue, we could end up with weather damage that exceeds the entire GDP of the world by 2060. It just keeps getting worse. And what happens if rising sea levels happen? So you have a little bit of warmth in the water. The water expands. Water expands when you cook it um, in a pot. And you can have the polar caps melt. We have uh, of all that water, imagine it going there. We could flood the coasts where 75% of the people live. And as I've shown this uh, talk to people, I took for granted people knew the term I was using. Climate migrants. These are people who've had to move because they can't live where they live any longer because the climate has made it impossible. You can have an island where you're growing food, and all it takes is just one wave of salt water, and you can never grow crops there again. So 
We're in High Point, North Carolina. This is what'll happen. We're right about here. This is what'll happen. It'll become low point. We'll be submerged under the water if this happens, and we won't be the only place. Now, you may think from this that there's a lot of water. Actually, there's not very much water at all. If you dumped a beach ball in the water and you had a few drips over, left over, that's how much would be left. I've gone to audiences hundreds of times and said, how much water? How much of the earth is water? Anyone want to guess what the percentage is? 70. People say 70. No, it's 0.06% water. And that little tiny dot there, that's all the water. But 97% of that is salt. Do you know how we desalinate salt water? We do it with diesel fuel. And 2% of that is ice, and 1% of that is fresh water. And the rest of it is the atmosphere. So how are we treating the water with fossil fuels? Well, natural gas creation in the US alone uses 4.5 trillion gallons of water. China uses 36.5 trillion to burn their 4 billion tons a year of coal out of 8 billion tons a year of coal we do. It takes 51,000 gallons of water to make one tank of biofuel. Solar uses 1.7 million times less than biofuel to get the same amount of energy. Why do we want to destroy our water? That's a map of fraccidents, accidents from fracking. I worked my way through MIT as a drilling engineer for Mitchell Energy and Development, which is the pioneer of fracking in America. North Carolina has set a new low for the entire world by banning disclosure of the 600 different chemicals that are in fracking fluid. The EPA only tracks 13 of them. You may be drinking poison water without even knowing it. How would you know if you don't know the chemicals so you can't monitor them? This is a map that shows, or a diagram that shows the various amounts of water use. Uh, you use 1,100 gallons per megawatt hour for coal, 800 for nuclear, 300 for natural gas, and zero for solar. We talk about how great America is now that we're the number one producer of oil in the world. But the first quarter of this year, GDP shrank by 2.9%. How does that go together? We're the number three importer of fossil fuels, not very independent, and the number two importer of oil. China just passed us in that category, which means it competes with us. Now, there's something called the oil curse. There's a whole book about this. The 40 or so nations that have a lot of oil can be compared to the ones that don't. Do they have better economic prosperity? No, they have greater inequality, they have slower growth on average, more government corruption. And why? Well, part of it is it takes $3.5 million to create an oil field job. There's so many more ways to create jobs that are like that, that are, that are basically where $50,000 can create a job. So this is America now. This is the US government's big picture of where energy comes from. We get 80% of our energy from fossil fuels, 18% from coal. That's awesome. That's great. This is, a, um, this is down quite a lot. For electricity, it's 28% of electricity down from 50% just three years ago. So this is amazing. We're going in the right direction. 29% from natural gas, 35% from oil. And it's about 9% for nuclear, about 9 to 10% for renewables. But here's the great news. When we started making solar panels for photovoltaics, it's about $100 a watt. And right now, the average cost in California per installed system is about $5 a watt. It's heading down to 25 cents a watt. Compared to oil, solar photovoltaics have improved 5,300 times since 1973. And they're heading by 2020, 2022 to 12,000 times better. And the result of that is solar installations are booming. This is where we are in North Carolina. Awesome. North Carolina, not so great with fracking fluids. Awesome with solar. Well done. Good job. What does this mean? North Carolina, if it wanted to make, I don't know, a trillion dollars a year, could provide all of the electricity for the entire United States. You have the land area, and you have the solar profile of the state to do that. You just have to get out there and start building. And every panel you build makes all future costs less expensive. I want to show you something that a city can do. What can you do to actually make solar happen? So this is what Las Vegas is, has done. Uh, the CEO of the company that I'm the chairman of, Everblaze, installed these panels. They provide 6% of the energy use. But what's interesting is that they're bifacial. 
The sun comes not only in the top, but 30% of it reflects off the bottom. And these exist now. If you go to Las Vegas, uh, you can see these operating uh, right now. So with these are what we're building now. I want these to be going in every municipal parking lot. Uh, we call these Everblaze solar trees. I brought a 3D printed model of what they'll look like. And the idea is that you'll put them in parking lots. They get sun from the top. They get sun from the reflection. And they provide shade for the cars that are doing it. Now, why do you want to have that? Well, within 100 feet of where I live in Santa Monica, California, the city has put over 30, uh, has put 32 parking uh, slots because of all the people with Teslas and other electric cars so that people can charge for free. The city wants to encourage people to come and drive electric cars. This is how you do it. It's just like if you want people to come and have a drink, make a water fountain. Just make solar panels and you'll have more people driving cars. How much sun do we have? Do we have enough sun? According to the former president of MIT, we get more sun in an hour than we basically need for all the energy needs of the Earth in a year. Now, here's the slide where I pay off the title of this talk. This is something that's never been shown before, and it's real. And this is, with the, with the introduction, is this for real? This is for real. Solar grew 41% last year. If you want to figure out how long it takes something to double, you just take 72 and divide it by that number. 70 Two divided by 36 gives you a doubling time of every two years. So solar is growing faster than this, and there's reason to think it will grow even faster than 41%. In places like China and India, it's growing 300%. That's what happened last year. So 2016, 2% of all of our electricity is from solar. 2018, 4%. 2020, 8%. 2022, 16%. This is where it starts to get great. 2024, 32% of our electricity is from solar, and boom, we stop using coal. It's over, 2024. Boom, 2026, 64% of our energy is from solar, and there's no more re reason to use natural gas for a very simple reason. Because even if they offer it for free, you have generation, transmission, distribution, there's no reason to pay for the transmission distribution because it's already cheaper to use the solar that's right there. And then, four more years, and boom, we're now producing two and a half times as much energy as we're using, and it's all electricity, it's going into electric cars, and we've, used, we've ended the use of oil by July 4th, 2030, just like I asked, just like my goal was in the beginning. And what about all those cars that exist on the road? There's a billion vehicles on the road. We just sold 82 million more. What happens to those? It's very simple. We convert them to run on ammonia. NH3, one nitrogen, three hydrogens. The air right now that we're breathing is 78% nitrogen. Ammonia, 82% nitrogen. You produce it in your body. You produce about 50 grams a day. If you're working out and sweating, you produce more than that. It's part of us. So what we're going to do is basically change cars over to run on ammonia. And then we also use it for fertilizer. Ammonia is the second most traded commodity. Uh, after uh, petroleum, 200 million tons a year, 200, uh, 200 million tons, 80% of which is used for fertilizer. We can reduce the cost of food. If instead of $1,000 a ton for ammonia, and with the current prices, what if we could make ammonia for $20 or $30 or $40? We would be a radical redistribution of wealth to the poorest half of the world. And this is basically how we do it. All we have to do to make the transition is learn about the real cost of carbon, realize how much we are already spending on renewables, and compete in renewables. The Sputnik effect. We, got, we created DARPA. We created NASA. We did GPS, all because of a be beeping tin can in space. We can compete for renewables. And there are places in Germany that are 400% self-sufficient in electricity from renewables. And then we make self-driving cars and green ammonia. Why electric vehicles? They're five times more efficient. If you're spending $400 a month for gasoline and you have an electric car, even at rates of 13 cents a kilowatt hour, you're going to spend $40 recharging your car. But if solar goes down the way that it's going, then those costs are going to be more like $4. But if you put up 
these solar trees in municipalities, and it's just like you expect clean air, you expect clean water, and you expect clean energy to be provided, then your costs are zero. The maintenance costs are also 90% less. And you can charge the batteries with solar in the day, and then at night, run your lights off your car. That's your storage. So you don't need to be on the grid at all. The end of oil comes from auto drive cars for a simple reason. Each auto drive car will replace 15 internal combustion engine cars. This is one of the greatest innovations. Google's all over it. Here's the eightfold path, the final thing. First, stop subsidizing and protecting fossil fuels. It's subsidized to the tune of $2 trillion a year. Let's put this in perspective. All renewable spending for the entire world was $224 billion. So we're spending 10 times as much subsidizing oil, gas, and coal as we are all for spending all of our solar. And remember, every well that you drill depletes the, well, the, the oil from, uh, or the natural gas from adjacency, so it's a diminishing return. It's a negative learning curve. When I drilled wells at MIT back in the early 80s, the average cost of a well was less than a million dollars. Now it's more than $15 million. It's getting more and more expensive. Imagine every panel you buy for solar actually reduces all the future panels that a trillion human beings will buy in the future. That is a legacy. It's just as good as donating to any charity. The second thing is set a specific date for your community, for High Point, for North Carolina, for the United States. And there are a number of very brave and admirable cities, counties, and countries that have said, we are going to be 100% renewable by this date. There are you know, walls of honor. This, to me, is the place that you want to be. San Francisco is here, 100% renewables goal. The city of San Jose is here. Google is here. It's a, it's a list of heroes, and I love them. Thank you. Uh, so the third thing is break up utility monopolies. The Hollywood studios used to control what people watch. So if your local theater was owned by Paramount, you had to only see Paramount movies. And it took 27 years of court battles before on basically 1947, starting in 1921, that finally you broke up the studio production from watching the movies in the theaters. We need to do that with generation. So you can be a generator or you can be involved in transmission or distribution, but not both. So then you can't force people to buy your electricity just because you happen to be in the local area, like a company town that makes you buy all their things. And then this is a simple one. The deck, the deck is stacked against solar. So if you're in a real estate investment trust or a master limited partnership, you can invest in fracking. You can invest in pipelines. You can invest in the asphalt to go on business on buildings, but you cannot invest in solar or wind. This would tree, uh, free up a trillion dollars for renewables just by itself. And we only spent 13 billion on solar last year, so it will be an enormous difference. Right now, about 75% of the cost of solar is for the financing. Also, end taxpayer and ratepayer subsidy. So if you declare right now, I am going to build a nuclear plant, you can start charging people more money. Five years go by, you go, oh, well, uh, we're not going to do it. You just keep all the money. But all the customers are forced to pay those rates. If you break ground on a gas or coal plant, you can raise the rates and never give the money back. But with solar or wind, you have to wait until it's finished to do it. End that. Also, reverse regulatory capture. The Department of Energy and Department of uh, the Bureau of Land Management are both basically in control of fossil fuel companies. 22,000 permits to drill for oil and gas or to mine for coal on public lands owned by all of us as taxpayers uh, have been granted. And they use 144 million acres. If you're on just 8% of that, you could power all of the United States with solar. 120 requests for solar permits were given to BLM. And they went, oh my gosh, we're overwhelmed. We have to take an 18-month moratorium for considering permits anymore. It's not equitable. Also, we need to implement an emission trading system and a carbon tax and increase it each year. This is the map. This is another badge of honor. Mexico has an emission trading system, and they have a carbon tax. And then finally, make companies clean up their mess. You can cause companies to have to pull all the carbon dioxide out of their air. 
Even if I'm wrong about this, and even if I'm wrong about the solar, Mark Jacobson at Stanford has said that solar in his model of being fossil free only accounts for 40%. So what does the solar world look like? 500 billion in subsidies saved a year, 886 billion in healthcare costs, four and a half trillion gallons of water, energy abundance. Last thing is, there's no technological or economic barrier to converting the entire world to clean, renewable energy. It's a question of whether they have the societal or political will. Thank you very much.